Nation News for October 7th through 13th. Two big stories making the news. President Donald Trump has rolled back the federal requirement for employers to include birth control coverage in their health insurance plans. The other big story is that the U.S. House of Representatives has passed the Pain-Capable Unborn Child Protection Act prohibiting abortions after five months gestation. The House vote was 237 to 189. Statistics show that each year 18,000 women have abortions after five months of pregnancy. You know, when you go against a culture of convenience, uh, you're going to have trouble. Several times we had threat phone calls to the house. I mean, usually it was just calling you a bunch of dirty names and, and then hanging up. But in one instance, one of the kids answered the phone and the person said something to the effect of, we're going to shoot your father, you know, you better watch out. In, in another case, I answered the phone and was told that I should go to the morgue to identify my husband's body. One night we heard a couple of crashes and the windows were broken out. And next morning we found two great big bricks in the house, one through the living room, which just missed the piano, and one in the dining room. One time I was uh, hit by a, a whole can of paint, black paint, and when I turned around to see who had thrown the paint at me, they swung the brush with the paint across my eyes. I had to have the paint removed from under my eyelids later on. Uh, we've had everything thrown at us. Uh, we have been called everything you can think of. In a lot of ways, it's the more subtle persecution um, that I think has a bigger impact on you over time. Family members who you know, can't get past your religious convictions or your you know, political views or who you're voting for, you know, friends from high school who you see at the reunion who don't want to talk to you because of the work that you're doing. I was working as an account executive for a public relations firm after I quit teaching at the University of Notre Dame. I really loved the job, but when I read Roe v. Wade, Doe v. Bolton, I realized our nation was in big trouble. Everybody's known or read about or heard about Roe v. Wade, and that's almost all that the press let people know. But if you read Doe v. Bolton, the twin decision that came out with Roe v. Wade same day, it says that for any reason of health, which could be that a woman says she's going to commit suicide or I can't afford another child or whatever, she can have an abortion. That changed our whole lives. And um, I, s I discovered a whole different side to Joe. I mean, he was always a very spiritually based person. He'd studied in the seminary for many years and his faith was very, very important to him as it was to me. He had marched with Martin Luther King in Montgomery, so we had done a few things like that locally too, but uh, abortion was just not on the radar screen at all. We didn't talk about it, we didn't know that there were cases going on. Um, I would never have expected that, that we would end up spending all this time doing this. I got interested in, in fighting abortion. I found out where the abortion clinics were. I went to them. I tried to talk to the women. In the process, my boss called me in and he said, Joe, why don't you go full time in fighting abortion? I said, well, how do I make a living? Well, he said, you got PR experience and stuff like that. You'll work it out. And so I started the Pro-Life Action League and very carefully picked out the name Pro-Life all the way. We're also against assisted suicide and so on. Uh, and it's uh, action. You've got to be out there, you've got to bring other people in, you've got to let them know there's a battle going on, and it's a league. We work with pro-lifers everywhere, including in Europe. We actually were so naive, we thought it would only take a year or two. All you had to do was let people know that, that the unborn baby is a human being. So these Americans, who actually love life, we thought, would rise up in righteous indignation and they would overturn the whole thing real fast. This won't take long because everybody's really good at heart, we thought. One of the most outspoken leaders of the anti-abortion movement was in the Bay Area today, and Bob Hirschfeld talked with him. 
The man in the black hat is the one to watch. He's Joe Scheidler, 59 years old, a former Benedictine monk. He's considered by many to be the father of the activist anti-abortion movement in this country. Abortion kill baby! Abortion kill His supporters in the Bay Area joined him here at the Pregnancy Consultation Center on Bush Street for what turned out to be a strictly symbolic protest since the abortion clinic had already closed for the day. All day long, the abortions go on here. Just that they're not doing them now doesn't really matter. This is the place. This is the death camp. And we're protesting it now because it, it deserves to be protested a day in and day out. Scheidler literally wrote the book on fighting against abortions. He's an effective speaker, holding his audience spellbound, mixing humor with a healthy dose of fire and brimstone. He doesn't talk about violence, his big hope is for a change in the Supreme Court, a new justice who vote to overturn the landmark decision that permitted abortions in the first place. If one of these guys, Bill Brennan or one of them, could be dragged screaming to an asylum somewhere and forced to resign or we could replace him, while Reagan's still president, we might turn this thing around overnight. And they know it. They know Joe Scheiber too. He's not a fighter to be underestimated. In San Francisco, Bob Hirschfeld for the 10 o'clock news. You have to try to convert people. St. Paul was not violent. St. John, none of the apostles were violent. They were trying to spread a message which was hard to spread. That's what we're trying to do. But we have to do it in a rational way, in a reasonable way. And wherever possible, we do it in the legal way. But sometimes, we, we felt it was time to go into the clinics and talk to the women sitting there. Well, that's trespassing. We would break the law where it was necessary to save a life, but never violently. Pro-choice groups agree that the protesters have a right to express their opinions on public property. But when these protesters go inside the clinic, the police are called in to restore order. Don't want anybody inside the place to bid. Uh -huh. okay. Well, that's our idea to keep everybody out of here. Michael Turco, News 36, tonight. I've only been arrested about a dozen, 18 times, nothing. I was picketing a NAF convention, that's the National Abortion Federation, and I was served a notice that I was being sued by the National Organization for Women because I was keeping people from having abortions and therefore the abortion clinics were not making the money they should. So before that was dismissed, they added RICO, Racketeered Influence Corrupt Organization charges, where you make money by committing crimes. You're kind of the, the man in the background. Other people commit the crimes, but you get the profit. Whatever damages you're charged with, they automatically triple. Well, we thought they can't use that against us. We don't make any money stopping abortion. So we took it to the Supreme Court all the way up. And the Supreme Court ruled unanimously they could use the RICO charges against us. And that started the case then where we heard all the lies that uh, I was a racketeer. Back in the earlier days of the pro-life movement, we had an, a national gathering every year. And I had two friends, Jerry Horn and Norm Stone, that owned a motel. To welcome us to their motel, they had the great big sign out in front, like most hotels do. And uh, Jerry Horn was putting up, pro-life activists have a ball. And he found out in his box he didn't have an extra L. So he thought, what can I say instead of ball? So he had, have a blast. So a have a blast became very serious in the court case. And uh, Faye Clayton, the attorney for now, National Organization for Women, showed it on a huge screen, have a blast as though we were planning bombings. And I was found guilty by a six-man jury, a six-person jury, of having violated the RICO. And so then we had to start the whole process of going through the courts. We needed to come up with a quarter of a million dollars um, when we were charged with racketeering. And so we lost our house during the case, we had to put it up. We had to go back up to the Supreme Court and they ruled eight to one that we were not guilty of RICO. Supreme Court three times, first case in history. Um, in the news, it's in the law books. You talk to kids studying law, oh yeah, I read uh, Now versus Scheidler, you know. That's good to get the, the message out.
we've had sandbags ripped open. You know, there's of course the uh, the famous and ubiquitous stop abortion now sign. Uh, I believe my dad actually came up with this concept. He's pretty sure he's humble, so he doesn't want to insist upon it, but I think that's probably true. That was his idea. This is the sign that really um, elicits a lot of uh, angry response. These signs were built up tall like this so that we could hold them over the overpasses of the Kennedy Expressway in downtown Chicago. Because the railing comes right about here. You know, there's a Our mission has always been to put regular pro-life people to work in their own communities, doing what they can to reach out and save unborn children from abortion. You know, we feel a great sense of sorrow that anybody would ever make that choice and a desire to help those who do, to help them to understand God's mercy and forgiveness um, so they can be made whole from that whole experience. Uh, it's very hard for people on the other side to understand how sincere we really are about this. Probably the biggest lie is that we don't really care about the unborn child that we don't care about the child after they're born, that we're really just all about controlling people, controlling people's sex lives or you know, controlling the culture. They can't understand that what really motivates us is a sense of responsibility to these children. Do you have a matching concern that you care to articulate about what happens after people are born and they, they come in uh, in poverty circumstances, not eating, not having received postnatal care, uh, trying to get an education and trying to live? That's the question? That is the question. I have a very deep concern for all human beings. I don't believe that you solve problems of, of uh, hunger and other by killing people. Well, but can you demonstrate this concern as you're demonstrating your concern for the unborn. Yes, I can. I mentioned that we have 3,000 pregnancy help organizations that take care of a woman before as well as after the pregnancy. We have run around town collecting money for baby food, for formula, places for these women to, to stay. I have had women uh, who are pregnant come and live in my house. We have helped them through the pregnancy and after the pregnancy. We're still in touch with them. We get them dental care. We help get some women off of drugs. There are uh, people all over the country who care, really care about these women. What do the abortionists do after the abortion? Do they really care for the woman? They collect the fee and that's it. And if she does have a problem, does she go back to the abortionist to get it solved? She goes to a good doctor. The high point of my pro-life career, I think, and I've had many high points because I've seen the babies that were saved and all, but it was a couple that at a meeting said that they had decided not to have an abortion because of an ad they saw in the Chicago Sun-Times. That was our ad. Now abortion is eight letters, so it's little. Baby is four letters, so it's big. So right in the middle of all the abortion ads is baby. And every week we could change it. So we could say, your baby has fingerprints, your baby has a heartbeat, your baby has brain waves, and baby would stand out. And this couple had seen that ad, they were ready for an abortion, and that particular ad saved a baby's life. I remember one time in Rockford, Illinois, we were out on the street and a woman came up to us and she seemed very emotional. But instead of arguing with us or yelling at us, she came up and fell into my mother's arms weeping because she had passed by one of our displays about two years, three years before, and had decided to cancel her abortion appointment and in her car was her little child, little toddler, who would not have been with her. Called him the love of her life, because we'd been there one day. And to, to get a little taste of the joy she had at being so close to making the wrong choice and losing that joy that was in her life, um, that's a tremendous privilege and really is a little piece of heaven. I hope that other people will take a look at the challenges that our culture faces and the, the world that, that our children and their children are growing up in and take it personally to really get involved. It will involve some sacrifices. You, you, you don't do that without a strong faith. And I do think that, that this is what God had planned. I mean, you look at, at Joe's background in his, his uh, seminary training and his PR background, layout and design, giving talks, getting a master's in public speaking. Um, every, everything came together to be what he needed in order to be the pro-life leader that he became. 
it's a, a life work which I didn't ask for. I never would have dreamed I would spend 44 years and maybe a few more uh, fighting for the unborn because I never thought in America we would allow the killing of a posterity. But we have killed millions of children in this country and thrown them in the garbage. And they aren't garbage. They're made in the image and likeness of God. Well, you know, my father's a very humble guy and he's always asking himself what more he could have done. And that frustrates me a little bit as his son because I, I, I don't know what more he could possibly have done. You know, he sacrificed so much for this cause. He sacrificed so much for these children um, who he has always had a special connection to. We can't presume on anything and I certainly will follow his instructions and pray for him when he finally leaves us. Um, pray for his soul and, um, you know, appeal to God and his mercy. But from where I'm sitting, you know, Joe Shiler's a saint. I just finished reading some 500 birthday cards and greetings for my 90th birthday that was September 7th. If you were one of the greeters, thanks a million. I was very humbled by these tributes to an old activist who just can't sit still while abortion is the law of the land. And thank you for calling Pro-Life Action News.